post-traumatic brain injury, or TBI, can be caused by brain injuries that actually penetrate the skull. So in this case, there is an open wound and damage to the bone structure known as the skull. Or TBI could also be a closed head injury due to um, things such as accidents, for example, a car accident, falls, um, violence like blunt force to the head, firearms, or sports, for example, in American football. It is estimated in the United States that every year there are 1.7 million co cases of TBIs. Falls are the most prominent cause, predominant cause of TBI followed by motor vehicle accidents, and then struck by or struck against movement as we see in the collision of American football. Also, um, firearms are the most common cause of TBI by assault and also the most common cause of fatal TBI. There's also a term called shaken baby syndrome. So this is also a form of TBI that's very important in the infant population. What happens in shaken baby syndrome is that the baby is shaken very violently back and forth, and this could damage the brain. In recent years, there have been cases of this, and actually in some cases, the parents or caregiver who shook the baby uh, were taken to court. So this is something to know for this population. And then, of course, a lot of us have heard in the news with surrounding um, concussions and traumatic brain injury regarding uh, football players. Now, if someone is hit in a way that is not appropriate, that the person who does the hit could be um, fined you know, tens of thousands of dollars or also be suspended from future games. Damage done to the brain tissue in TBI can be caused by the primary injury, whether it's a fall or injury from a firearm or sports injury, so things like that. But usually with the primary injuries, the body reacts and then there will be second injuries caused by cerebral edema and that refers to the fluid retention in the brain. So along with the hemorrhage, hematoma, and the infection. These are secondary events caused by the primary injury. But once these events occur, they do further damage. That's why we consider them secondary injuries. And all these events, both primary and secondary injuries, um, can cause a raise in intracranial pressure, or ICP. And this is because our skull is a very rigid bony structure. So when the intracranial pressure increases, the soft tissue often has nowhere to go because the shape of the skull does not change. Therefore, it sometimes ends up pushing brain tissue down towards the spinal cord. And if we recall the anatomy of brain tissue connecting to the spinal cord, that's what's called the brain stem. And this is where we find a lot of our vital centers that um, regulate and help keep us alive. However, with the increase of ICP, the brainstem is pushed down towards our spinal cord and these centers could be stuck at that entrance there and it could cause some fatal consequences. The patient could suddenly, um, their heart could stop beating or their blood pressure could drop instantaneously. So this is something very important for us to know. Also, the blood flow to the brain can be compromised as well due to these events and injuries. The exact clinical manifestations of TBI depend on the extent and the location of the injury. Because, as we mentioned in stroke, different parts of the brain have different functions, 
So um, for TBI, the signs and symptoms or even, you know, the aftermath, some of the long-term impacts really depend on where the injury occurs. So TBI patients will go through medical neuroimaging tests, and we already mentioned a few, PET scans, CT, MRI, and these help us identify the location of the injury as well as the severity of the injury. Also, we can use it in monitoring and it can help tell us the recovery progress of the patient. To assess the severity of TBI and at the same time predict the prognosis, the doctors use a scale and it's a point system called the Glasgow Coma Scale. So here is a summary of the Glasgow Coma Scale. We have um, three categories here. So we have um, eye-opening response, verbal response, and motor response. We can see all of these three categories that are being assessed. They are essential to um, indicators of our brain function. And this is because all of these require the brain to receive signals and respond. Uh, for example, with the verbal response, um, if we can react to people calling our names, that's an indication that there is some part of the brain function here. So we're, that would be we were able to recognize our own name and respond to it. But obviously, if there's no response, then that would be more severe. So same thing with verbal response and motor response. All of these are associated with exactly what brain function is still left and um, what has gone. So when we add it all up, we basically give them a point value based on um, their response. So if, you know, we had somebody who maybe was speaking but they weren't making any sense, we could give them two points on the verbal. And then if they respond to, you know, pain being their had some sort of reflex response um, with their eyes opening. If we, you know, took a pen and poked their arm or leg, then maybe they get another two points there. And then motor responses, um, if they had no response, they weren't able to really move or anything, even in response to pain, then we would um, give them one point. And so this would add up to five points. And so we see here that, and please pay attention, that, um, severe, that the scale is based so that the lower the scale, the more severe the injury is. So um, in this case, the higher the score is, the better. So that would mean that the injury is not as serious, and it also means that the patient has a higher chance of survival. To treat TBI patients, we first need to focus on stabilization of the condition of the patient, and this is done through maintaining oxygenation and blood flow to the brain, because we know that the brain is a big user of energy and oxygen. If we cannot open the blood supply, then further damage will incur on top of the TBI. At the same time, we want to prevent further complications. Remember, there is a primary energy injury, and then there are secondary injuries. And with the increasing ICP, if things are not managed well, we could see the patient develop more complications over time. A lot of um, patients may will need um, emergency support. For example, some patients that suffer from TBI will need mechanical ventilation and may need help um, increasing their blood pressure. Also, as part of the in injury, as we covered um, in the critical care unit of talking about metabolic stress, 
the general adapter, there will be fluid redistribution. Therefore, we need to try to bring fluid resuscitation to the patient because once we know that that happens, the patient can move to phase two, the flow phase, and then hopefully we'll be able to progress to the recovery phase. So um, fluid resuscitation is very important. In some cases, surgery may also be necessary. For example, if there's a severe hemorrhage or a hematoma that's causing the increase in ICP, the intracranial pressure, we may have to put the patient through surgery that would um, take care of that. So it would take out the blood or take care of the hematoma. Also, we could remove a piece of the skull so that we can open a window to accommodate the, int the high intracranial pressure temporarily. Then, once the pressure decreases and the swelling disappears, so the ICP goes back to normal, we can put that piece of bone back. A lot of patients suffering from TBI will need rehab. And the type of rehab will be determined by what area of the brain was injured and, of course, the severity of the injury. In all conditions of TBI, nutrition therapy is an integral part of the team. So dietitians definitely have a role in treating TBI patients. TBI is a classic example of metabolic stress Therefore, when we approach the TBI patients, it's very common for us to see these conditions in the, these patients. They are experiencing the hypermetabolism. They have a very resistant hyperglycemia due to insulin resistance and the increase of gluconeogenesis. As a result, they mobilize lipids to supply additional fuel to the body. So that would be a catabolism going on there as evidenced by negative nitrogen balance. As part of the stress response, patients will lose lean body mass. The problems for the nutrition diagnosis of TBI patients are related to hypermetabolism, inadequate intake, or motor and cognitive impairments. So all of these are associated with the nature of the injury and the metabolic stress the injuries bring out. TBI patients require aggressive nutrition support. So we really want to initiate early and provide what the patient needs. And energy needs are highly varied based on the situation. Again, the type of injury and the severity of injury. In certain cases, medication can also affect the energy requirement. For example, a lot of TBI patients will be put into a medically induced coma, and this itself could actually reduce the energy requirements. So that's something we need to consider. Right now, the recommendation is that because the energy needs for TBI patients are highly variable, we should use indirect calimetry uh, to estimate the needs. Or if the indirect calimetry is not available, we can use 140% of estimated uh, resting energy expenditure. So we would select the appropriate predictive equation to estimate the resting energy expenditure, then multiply it by 140% or 1.4. And this is because this is a metabolic stress condition, so the requirement is high. Protein allowance here is 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. If we recall in other critical unit conditions, this range is on the higher end of the range for these category of patients. So 1.5 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. The type of nutrition support selected usually is enteral nutrition first, unless there is a contraindication. When we select enteral nutrition, we should keep in mind 
that the stomach in TBI patients may be compromised as well. It may be injured if the injury um, affected more than just the brain. So for example, in motor vehicle accidents, injuries could affect different parts of the body, including the stomach. Or some medications could affect stomach function and also because of the uh, metabolic stress, we could see the possibility of stress ulcers. So with the traumatic injury that the body sustains, the response could be the stomach having an ulcer. Therefore, it's not uncommon for TBI patients. Um, we probably may, we may not see the use of a gastric tube, so no G-tube. Therefore, when this is the case, we want to use some enteric tube, so like a nasoenteric tube, so that the ending of the tube is in the small intestine. Since we prefer early initiation of nutrition support, if the EN cannot be provided or achieved within the first 72 hours, then we will go to PN. So this is something really critical. We want to get it early enough, otherwise we will choose an alternative route. If the patient over time cannot advance to a PO diet, then we can have a PEG tube placed and deliver um, directly deliver the formula to the stomach. So this would be later on um, after the initial injury. Remember, PEG stands for percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. It means you know percutaneous through the skin. And you can see in the diagram here. Um, and also remember there's a video posted with the EN workshops and you can uh, view how the procedure is done. So the endoscope is inserted down the esophagus all the way to the stomach. So here it is in the stomach and there's a little light there. Um, and also through this optic fiber, the doctor can observe what is going on. And then the insertion of the peg tube is done through the skin. So you can see here, this, this would be the outer part of the skin, the subcutaneous fat layer, then uh, the muscle of the abdominal cavity, and eventually it penetrates the stomach and ends up inside the stomach. Again, this endoscope can provide a way for the doctors to observe if the tooth tube is placed in the right place. So some dietetic internship programs may require that their interns observe a placement of a peg at least once during their rotation. So this would be a great opportunity to observe this. We need to closely monitor patient status changes because the TBI patient's conditions could change rapidly. Of course, if they're on enteral support, we need to check the tolerance. And if there is a regular bowel movement and the fluid and the hydration you know, status is need, going to be, need to be monitored because fluid shifts are very common in TBI patients. We also want to advance nutritional care as appropriate and we will have to pay close attention when we're weaning a patient off from EN support, for example, and when we're trying to rely more and more on the PO diet to provide the nutrition needs. So during this transition period, we need to pay close attention to ensure adequate intake.